in review what we are learning by doing this portrait bust is how to measure scale, scale and proportion, and um, achieve a degree of symmetry. Also, we find out from the visible planes that have been abstracted um, that the human head is not round. Um, these, these planes offer uh, sort of landmarks for areas of the face that can, I can give names. So for instance, the crown of the head, which is back here behind the vertical key line, the hairline, which is this obvious turn from the top of the head and the forehead, the brow, the cheek, the dome of the chin, and so on like that. Notice that in the last segment, I located where the ears should go, the size of the ear, and in relation to the key lines that I put there on that side, and now I need to restore the key lines over here. So these marks that I make, as soon as I make them, I'm going to step back and look to see if there's any um, imbalance. So if there's more mass on this side of the key line, I'll be able to see it because I'm just looking at a third or a quarter of the area in relation to the other quarter of the area and so on like that. When it's time to make an adjustment, this is the takeaway part of the tool. This is the adding back part of the tool. Now I drew a key line back here and notice that this shoulder, as I stepped back away from a piece, at least arm's length, I notice that this shoulder is slightly higher than that one. You have to ask yourself, well, which one is, uh, is the, this one too low and that one's the right, or is this one too high and that one's not? Well, it's usually a little bit of both. So you take the, use the takeaway side, which is this rake loop blade, and scoop away a little bit of it, put it in your hand, put it over there to, on the other side, and then settle it down again with that rocking and shoving action that I showed you in the last segment. Now, sim simple is good. What we're looking, we're, as we get closer to the uh, final uh, product here, I'm, I'm trying to eliminate any unwanted detail uh, that's, you know, just, it's just, part of designing is editing. And with editing, less is more. Less detail is better. Later, when you've achieved this, when you've gotten your piece of clay to look like this piece of clay or the disc fired prototype, what I'll do is take a photograph of it. You'll write your name here on a piece of paper. I'll shoot a picture of you with your project so that I can put it in my gradebook that you've achieved the compulsory part of the project. And then the next step will be for you to choose a subject that will make the project your own. I've got lots of tips about what to do. I'm going to move to a slide um, presentation uh, after this to kind of give you some pointers as to how to choose a subject. Most times people you either pick movie stars or superheroes because their character is so vivid that it's easy to capture what's called a caricature. Um, all expressions are going to be exaggerated in order to make the, uh, your portrait come alive. Once you've decided who or what you're going to uh, make a likeness of, you're going to need at least five camera angles. Straight on, left profile, right profile, left three quarter, right three quarter, minimum. Now, lighting is really important. 
this person, whoever shot this, was very careful to light it in such a way that the contours were clearly visible in deep shadow and highlight. Um, if you're taking a, see, I, I'm going to give you some advice about what not to do. Don't do a portrait of a loved one, a boyfriend, your mother, because it's just going to be trouble. They're going to, they're going to give you crap about how big their nose is or something. So just don't even go there. And don't even try to do a, a, a child or an infant because they won't sit still long enough to get a picture of. And their face is so full of a baby fat that it's going to be really hard to do the detail. So that's why people usually do movie stars and superheroes because those are characteristics that are easy to capture. Now we're going to go into more detail uh, with eyes, nose, and mouth, and ears. To do that kind of detail, you're going to need these three essential tools. We already identified this one as the popsicle stick. It's got a spoon scoop at this end and a blade uh, side. This is a wire loop tool. It's got a, fl uh, a straight and a curve, or diagonal. Uh, that it, it is what it sounds like, wire. And this is the eye-making tool. <laughs> There's no other word for it. Um, and these are all in your sculpture kit that you bought at the bookstore. So here I've got uh, the down plane of the brow and the up plane of the cheek right at the horizontal key line on your, um, I'm going to call it the blank, <laughs> because it's just a universal uh, um, proportion for a, for a likeness. So I'm going to start by making a shallow with my thumb where the eye socket's going to be. And I, try, and I need to do it bo on both sides so that there is, again, um, a measure of symmetry. Now, m most people make the, f see, oh, so I've got a handout of images from a book that has a chapter in it called Common Mistakes. And the purpose of the book, is that chapter, is to help you see the most common mistakes people make. So on this page, the angle of the eye is uh, a detail of a sculpture in profile. Now, in the first image, you see that the angle, uh, the top lid of the eye and the bottom lid are almost vertical. That's not going to look right. So in the second image, you see that the artist has added clay to the brow and uh, top lid and moved the angle of the bottom lid back so that there's much more of a diagonal. You have your project on a turntable, so you're constantly looking at the profile and, fra and working frontally, then stopping and looking at the profile and, and so on like that. It, you need to have that dynamic motion in order to keep track of what you're doing, or, see, or even to see the effect of what you're doing. So I'm going to start by making a ball of clay that's surprisingly large um, because I'm going to want clay for both eye and eyelid in this recess that I've made. So that looks way too, like way too much clay. Well, that's because I've made twice the clay I want, and then I'm going to cut it in half and use the two halves on either side so that I know I'm getting an equal amount of clay, I'm using an equal amount of clay on both sides. Now it's time to use the scoop side of your um, popsicle stick tool to settle this down, the clay down into the socket so that it seems like uh, an eye and eye lid. Most beginners apply way too much clay at this stage. So, you know, be on the lookout for that common mistake. Now, as I'm rocking, I'm using that same rocking and shoving action with this tool as I did when I was using the larger tool for the rough out. Now, 
I'm going to turn this to the side so that you can see that I've pushed the, the bottom part of the amount of clay back into the uh, face more so that the top lid will be more, it's more likely that the top lid will extend forward. On the page uh, from Common Mistakes chapter called the medial corner of the eye, you can see that I've drawn a horizontal key line right across the eye in this larger image and in the smaller image. The smaller image shows us a common mistake everyone makes when they first do portraiture, where the corners of the eye are on, a, uh, are on the same, lay, uh, same horizontal. The cor this corner is the same as on, as on the, the corner by the nose is the same as the corner by the ear. In this example, this is the correct example, the corner of the eye close to the nose is way lower than the corner near the ear. So now let's go back to this project and see what can be done to make that make sure that happens. So if I draw a key line across this one, you can see that the, the this I have created a kind of uh, the the corner in the, of the eye here, where this where my tool is, is definitely lower than the corner of the eye here, where my tool is. Now the next thing I'm going to do is take my wire loop and scrape away some of the clay that got bunched up in the process of creating the top lid. Now my next move is to uh, switch to this eye making tool because it's much more precise and I can get uh, my, I can articulate where I want the roundness of the eye. Most beginners just push straight in with this tool and it tends to make it look very flat. So by pushing in on the corners inside by the nose and the outside by the ear, the center part just naturally comes up. I don't have to add any clay to make it seem rounder. The next common mistake that students make is that when they get to this point, they realize, oh, there's still no bottom lid. Well, I'm going to, well, let's see, what can I do about that? I'm going to make this little snake and put it there, and that'll be my bottom lid. Well, here, that, 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 in theory, that sounds like it would work, except if you look in profile now, clearly the bottom lid is ahead of the top lid. And so the angle of the eye is off. And it's never going to look right, no matter how many different which ways uh, or what subject you pick. So instead of adding clay for the bottom lid, the answer is to take away clay from the cheek. Most people apply too much clay at the cheek anyway. So that's the simple answer to how do I get a bottom lid? You, do, you get it by subtraction. And of course, the most precise tool for doing that is your blade loop tool. So I'm just going to move clay down and away to, to get a bottom lid, like so. Now I want to pause here. Uh, see, I could do the other eye, uh, but um, for the sake of the um, uh, brevity of the, of the, of the uh, video, I'm going to uh, move to another area. I'm going to talk about the actual working parts of the nose. In this, on this page, the example of the nose, is it's been dramatized or simplified so that you can clearly see that there's at least three working parts of the nose. I'm going to call this part the bulb of the nose. And then this is one of two domes of the nose. And if you draw a key line right down the center of this photograph, you'll see that they are half of the nose is dome and half of the nose is bulb. And then here you can see from the front, up at the top, it's narrow, gets wide, and then gets narrow again. 
And then there's a definite tilt word, downward tilt for the nostrils. So let's go to our project and see if we can find ways to articulate that. So what I've done is I've just made a very simple shape here. Now I'm going to apply small amounts of clay on both sides of that simple shape to indicate the dome of the nose. And I'm going to make sure that I make it small enough that it's a distinctly Let's see, let's, let's, let's actually draw a key line here so that you can see that the front half is the bowl of the nose, the back half is the dome of the nose. I'm going to do that on both sides so that there's, it articulates uh, the working parts of a nose. Like that. And I'm going to keep it simple and abstract uh, for the time being. Um, for this for this tutorial. Also, I'm going to make it a little bit narrower at the by up at the brow, and a little bit wider in the middle, and then the bulb needs to be made more roundish like that. Okay, so that's the anatomy of the nose. You can use your blade, your wire loop here to actually carve out or excavate the nostrils, like so, underneath the nose. In this diagram, you can see uh, the working parts of the mouth. There's uh, pads of fat here and here on the bottom lip, a corresponding pad here in the center of the top lip, and two on either side. So the part, and what the, if, if, if you are aware of where those are located, then you, that will affect how you um, uh, shape the parting line of a mouth. So if, if you follow along the parting line in this drawing, you'll see that it looks like um, a recurve bow. They call it Cupid's bow. That's also repeated up here at the boundary between the top of the lip and, the and your face. So let's see how that can be executed on our sculpture here. The first thing that I need to do is, uh, with my popsicle stick, open this up like a, a wedge shape so that I have access to the inside out. The next thing I need to do is move the corners of the mouth further into the face by taking away some of it, like that. Otherwise, it's going to look very flat. And it's important to do that in a very, as symmetrical as possible so that you have some balance between the right and left sides of the face. Now, it appears when I step back that I've gone, haven't gone far enough on this side. The next thing I need to do is add those pads of fat to the bottom lip, and this doesn't take a lot of clay. I just need to know that it's there. So I'm going to add those, and then I'm going to use the tool we call the eye-making tool to help us uh, settle that down and model it uh, so it looks natural. So there's a recess right down the center here on either side of those pads of fat. And then, again, on the top lip, there's a corresponding pad of fat in the center, here. So I'm going to use a small amount of clay to accomplish that. And then, um, let me tilt this up so I can... Oh, another thing to remember is that the clay is plastic, and if you, if you have access to the inside of the mouth and it looks too far open, you can always close it when you're done. Okay, so now, let's see if I can eliminate some unwanted detail here with my um, popsicle stick, the spoon side of my popsicle stick. Okay. Looks like I need just a little bit more clay on either side of the top lip. So I'm going to put some more clay in there on both sides. Try to, I'm going to try to make it as equal on both sides as possible. There we go. Now, the next common mistake, 
people make with the mouth is that they allow the bottom lip to be further forward than the top lip. And that really frustrates people because if you do that, it's never going to look right. So to give your, the mouth the kind of dimension it needs, most people uh, make the mouth real flat across here, like you see in the first picture. Um, the uh, corners of the mouth should be deeper into the face than the surrounding tissue. And there's a bulge on either side of the corners because there's a muscle that links the top and bottom lid that needs to be observed and added. And you can see in this example, the tool has been, that clay, clay pads have been applied and the tool has been used to settle that down to make it look natural. Also, in this image, you see that the top lip is clearly further forward than the bottom lip. So let's see if we can source that on our example. Now, when I turn mine in profile, the bottom lip is about the same as the top lip. I want it to recede a little bit more than the top lip. So rather than adding, this one of the beginner mistake is, oh, I need it, the lip to stick out more. Instead of adding to the top lip, let's first try removing some of the bottom lip. Um, there's, the, most people, when they first try portraiture, add too much clay for features anyway. So I'm going to try that strategy first. Now I'm going to have another look at my profile and see if that helped. Okay, now you can see that the top lip is clearly further forward. So those are some, that's, that's the most common mistake and the most um, effective solution to that problem. Now, the next thing I want to make note of is I want to restore that conical key line that I put on the piece before I started doing these details just so that you can notice that there's some important changes that happen along that key line. So for instance, the dome of the nose ends on that key line. There's a, a boundary between the top lip and the cheek that lands on that key line. The corner of the mouth lands on that key line. And there's a distinct change between the shape of the chin and the shape of the jaw all along that key line. Um, so it's important to have that from the very beginning and restore it as you go along, just so that you're you know, aware of the end points for these details, nose, mouth, and chin. When we break down the ear into working parts, um, I'm just kind of making up words that help visualize. I'm going to start with the ear opening where sound comes in. And I'm noticing that the negative space is about the same size as this uh, tissue here. So I'm going to call this the door. And the door is open. Uh, that kind of gives you a sense of the, what the size of things should be. Uh, then the next thing I'm looking at is that there's this rim on the outside that spirals down like a seashell into that interior. So that spiraling down is the next thing that I make sure I show. And then this part of the ear looks like an ear inside the ear. That's another way to look at it. Uh, and then, of course, there's an ear lobe uh, that's usually uh, attached um, there's a kind of a undercut right here. Now, on a face, the ear lobe tilts slightly further forward than the top of the ears. And so that I've made sure to do that on our um, example. And um, the other thing I made sure of is that the opening or the door of the ear 
lands on the junction between the horizontal and vertical key lines. So I'm going to add that in right now to make that more vivid. Notice I'm using my um, popsicle stick tool to do that. So I made the little door first. Now I need to put this down. I'm going to get my um, wire loop tool and uh, exaggerate the dimension of that rim a little bit, like that, on the outer edges. And then, by the way, it's really hard to do this with your, it's pretty much impossible to do an ear with your fingers because your fingers are too big. So you need to learn how to use the tools. I'm, I'm using a combination of my eye, eyeball tool and my popsicle stick. Looks like I might have to add some clay right here to give, that, give the, uh, the impression of the ear inside the ear. So I'm going to add that now. And there's a little dent up at the top of that mass um, that needs to be added for it to look like an ear. So those are the kind of basic shapes that, uh, uh, features that all ears need to have to look convincing. And the challenge is creating those without adding any unwanted detail. So again, et design, part of designing is editing. It, 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 you can see how I'm settling down the clay if there's any uh, dimps or weaves or anything like that that are, that are in the way of seeing the ear. Once you've done the compulsory part of the assignment, it's time to choose a subject I'm going to recommend that you choose famous people, movie stars, superheroes, because they have such distinguished characteristics that it's really hard, it's, it's much easier to capture a likeness when there's uh, a face that everyone is very familiar with. A caricature, it, the word caricature, um, is trying to just, uh, describe a um, exaggeration of features. So here's a sculptural example. Uh, the, fin the face is very thin and narrow. The brow is extra furry. Um, where the wrinkles go in, they go way in. Where the tissue comes out, it comes way out. Um, the hair, you're never going to get clay to look like hair because hair is so different in its properties than clay is, but you can apply the place where the hair occupies and the visual rhythm of the, you know, mane or the, you know, the, uh, the hairdo. So once we've gotten, to, oh, oh, and one more thing. Um, Right now, this example has what I call Roman eyes, because in the old days, the Romans would carve uh, out of marble portraits, and then they'd paint in the eye details. Um, this is a, an example of what I call Renaissance eyes, where in the Renaissance sculptors started actually carving detail on the eye instead of painting it on. So right now, I'd like to do two things to um, help you know, demonstrate how to uh, accomplish uh, eyes and hair. Um, this now I'm going to uh, try to get the illusion of an iris and pupil on the eye so it doesn't look so vacant. And the tool I'm going to use is this wire loop that has the diagonal side. I'm going to use the top of this as an axle and the lower half I'm going to use as a scoop. 
So I'm going to put the axle right in the center above the, right below the top lid. And I'm going to try to keep it in the center as I turn the rest of the tool around like that to excavate uh, an amount of clay that's going to be used to capture light uh, or actually, yeah, to capture light and make it look darker in, in shadow. Now, um, if you actually saw your eyeball, you would be shocked. It's huge. We only see a small fraction of it because it, most of it's covered by eyelid and fat and pads. Um, so th the expression of your subject is going to be largely dependent on how much eyelid is covering the iris. So if there's nothing, no eyelid covering the iris, it's going to look like somebody's being electrocuted. If there's too much eyelid over the iris, it's going to look like the person's stoned or sleepy. So that is a very important sort of uh, design consideration. This one looks a little bit sleepy. So I'm going to take my um, eyeball tool and settle that down a little bit more and oh, so that it's a little bit more open. And then with the example I just showed you, there we go, um, this guy has what I call a sparkle. I've actually put clay back to make the eye look like it might be uh, wet, and that helps it make seem more alive. Let me see if I can get that back in there a little bit more. Yeah. If you do this, it's tricky. So most beginners don't even try to do that. And the, the trick that's tricky is getting the sparkle in the same place on both sides. And I'm, right now I'm having trouble doing that. As a matter of fact, I'm going to I'm going to skip that and move on to pointers about how to make hair. That, that's this is, I'm going to leave that leave that's well enough alone. Uh, right now, I'm not make I'm not for the purpose of this video. I'm not uh, wanting to make any particular person. I'm uh, just showing you the universal things that are true about all faces. Once you've chose your subject, you're going to do individual characteristics that make them uh, recognizable. Um, so to, when, when applying hair, the next thing that I notice is that this, this piece of clay was first modeled in abstraction in order to show that the human head is not round. Now, these planes of the face are in the way of it looking natural. So the first thing I'm going to do before I apply any hair is naturalize uh, those uh, distinctions and, and uh, junctions that were created when we were doing more of an abstract. And it's, it's pretty easy to do, but notice, notice that I'm not taking away the clay to get rid of it. I'm modeling the clay. I'm moving it instead of re removing it. So now I'm getting more, the forehead is more dome-like. I'm inclined to stop here and add clay. Um, for the, for the hair. People are, let's see, often surprised at how much hair, how much clay it takes to make hair. I always make sure that I've got a natural shaped head before I start applying hair. And when I start applying hair, 
I'm using the clay, pretty discrete amounts of clay at a time, no more than what you see here, which is about a piece of clay about the size of my thumb. And I'm going to add it like daub at a time as I go. Uh, sometimes I've seen sculptors so skillful that they can actually create the visual rhythm of hair as they apply it. Uh, I've, 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 I'm not at that place yet with, with portraiture. So I'm going to just apply what appears to be the right amount. And then I'm going to use various tools to experiment, experiment with various tools to help me find uh, the kind of effect that makes it look like the, what I call the visual rhythm of hair. Again, the clay should be fresh enough that it'll stick to itself, so you don't have to take any measures with water or scoring or anything like that. Oh, that reminds me of something that you'll need to know about. Um, when you come each time, um, I'll show another, in another segment, I'll show how to wrap your uh, project um, so that it doesn't dry out uh, between the t uh, between labs. So again, one of the the, the important reason to be on a sculpture stand is so that you can step back and see what you're doing. Um, to um, keep track of symmetry and proportion. So I'm, if I'm going to apply this clay to the hairline, I'm going to want it to be somewhat symmetrical on both sides. Um, sometimes people get really frustrated with the details of the ear. Um, if you're one of those people, you just start tearing it. Don't tear your hair out trying to get the details of the ear if you could just as easily cover it up with hair later. <laughs> okay. that, that's an answer to the problem. Uh, a lot of times sculptors will just hide what they can't figure out. Um, one thing that occurs to me, a common mistake, maybe not so much a mistake, but a misunderstanding about clay is, um, let's say you wanted your project to have uh, dreadlocks. Well, that's cool. I'll just make some snakes, coils, over here on the table, and then I'll just stick them on there. Like that, then. We'll have Bob Marley in no time, right? Well, here's the problem with clay. Um, it doesn't have, clay has lots of compression strength, but it has no lateral strength at all. So if there's anything like hanging out like that, it's gonna break off. Uh, it's just a matter of time. When you're wrapping it up for the day, when you're done and taking it to the kiln, when you're putting it in the kiln, or taking it out of the kiln, there's any p number of places where that's gonna break off. So in a later segment, I will show you, if you want hair hanging down, it has to be supported, which means you're going to have to mass it in. As a matter of fact, I might as well just go on ahead and give this project long hair to demonstrate what I mean. So right now, if you see in profile, there's the recess here of the neck. Well, long hair cascades straight down. If I put the hair on like a slab and there's a gap here, that's going to get collapsed and break when it's time to remove this from the armature. So we're going to have to stick with the same strategy that we started with, which is applying 
clay solid onto an armature. So if I'm going to put more hair, if I'm going to have hair that cascades down, I have to first fill in all of that recess that was the neck first. Now notice, I'm noticing that I need to get my um, larger tool to settle this down as I go. Otherwise, I'm going to have gaps. You're going to want to apply the clay in such a way that there's no gaps. And I may actually run out of clay, so I'm just, I'm just going to concentrate on one side. The first step, the compulsory uh, section, or the compulsory part of this assignment, will, will you, can, you can accomplish that with 25 pounds of clay, one bag of clay. But once you've started on to your making it your own, your, your, the subject, your chosen subject, you're going to have to get more clay. Because I'm now... I just went past 25 pounds. Let's see now. Um, for the sake of demonstrating how hair needs to cascade, I'm going to continue. I'm going to need to cover up part of the ear. So I've applied enough hair now to show how the clay needs to be filled all in behind the neck so that the hair uh, has support under it. And then I added uh, clay here in front to suggest that it's cascading down over a shoulder. So, well, I had to add a little clay for a shoulder in order for that to create that uh, appearance. So now, um, what I'm after now is trying to imitate the way hair lays on uh, the person's body and how gravity uh, pulls the hair down and so it cascades like this. So there's no, the beginner uh, will sometimes not make that observation and they'll have this sway here. The clay, uh, hair doesn't do that. It comes straight down because gravity makes it do that. Um, another thing that I'm aware of right now the limitations I have of this with this project is that I don't have a reference. I'm just doing the things that are generally true about all of the let's see methods and techniques that you'll need to learn to apply. So you will have a picture or you know you'll have six pictures from different angles so you can tell what you're going to be doing next with the hair. So I'm at a disadvantage right now um, with making more detailed choices about the way the hair should be. So I'm just kind of have to, I'm going to be just making it up. I, I don't want you to be doing that. I want you to be work, working from a reference. So um, two points that I can make real quick here. Back to our um, popsicle stick tool. When it's time to create a boundary between the forehead and the side of the face and the hair, you're going to take your, um, you'll, the, you'll apply some, uh, a significant amount of clay above the already human shaped head and then here at the boundary, you're going to put your, the blade side of your popsicle stick up against the forehead and then pull it back like that so that it actually creates a visible boundary between the clay of the hair and the clay of the head. So it's this, turn, it's this come up under and then flip over action that makes that uh, junction uh, convincing. And then um, another beginner mistake that people make when they try adding texture is they do this thing I call marchy, where they make a 
stroke that's very evenly spaced and, you know, almost like, well, uniform. Any kind of uniform um, action uh, really doesn't work. There is a tool that you have to get at the hardware store called a scoring tool. And I, it's basically um, a paintbrush comb. So I'll go through the tools you need in detail. But this is the paintbrush comb that uh, this student got from the hardware store. And I've seen people think, oh, well, I'll use that to create the texture of hair. Well, that's a really good example of marchy. You know, soldiers in a row. That's where I get the term. Uh, hair doesn't do that. <laughs> so this is not the, good, the right tool for the job. Um, I'm going to, what I'm going to use right now is the back of a disposable brush. You'll, you'll have a disposable brush in your kit. And I'm going to kind of give you an example of how to avoid marchy. So notice that I'm doing this kind of wristy curve this way and that to create a, uh, an, a, a gesture uh, that is... Um, it's not so much random as it is natural or organic uh, in, its, in its effect. And where I go in, when I go in, I go way in. Where it comes out, so that where it comes out, it comes way out. Now, it's going to do some things, irregular things, to the clay that you may not want. If you try to clean that up, you're just going to kind of mull over the and nullify the energy that you've created. So what I teach people how to do is leave that sort of thing alone for the time being and wait. When you come back later and this is almost leather hard, or the hardest of leather hard, you can just chip those off. And that'll look much more natural. Um, in, my, in the next segment, we're going to, I'm going to show now, how to um, remove the project from the armature. To do that, you would need for this to dry out uh, enough that it holds its own shape. We call that leather hard. Um, but let's say that you aren't satisfied with this yet, and you want to put it away for the day. Uh, the, in this next segment, I'm going to show how you use a combination of plastic uh, bag and f wet flannel to preserve the moisture of your piece so that when you come back the next class period in the lab, you'll, you can just pick up where you left off and the clay is just as fresh as it was the, in the last segment. This segment is just about how you put your artwork away for the day. Um, so it begins with spraying it. You, each of you will have your own heavy duty spray bottle and you're going to mist this all over uniformly. And then by that time you'll all, each, each of you will have acquired some flannel um, and um, most people know flannel when they see it. The shirt I'm wearing is flannel, um, the, and lots of wintertime bed clothes are flannel. And so this is a, just about this is a, the right size. The size you want is about the size of a big pillow. Um, so a flannel pillowcase would work. Now I'm going to take that flannel and I'm going to dunk it in water and get it thoroughly wet. And then I'm going to wring it out. And now that the piece is wet, the flannel is more um, likely to um, adhere. So the trick to applying the flannel is getting it to stick to every part of your project. Now see how it's wanting to uh, stretch over this gap? You're not going to allow that. You're going to get the flannel to stick to all parts of your project because you want the 
moisture to remain uniform. You don't want some parts dry and some parts wet. You want it as uniform as you can get it. Then you're going to cover it with plastic, the kind of plastic, you know, uh, hef I'm going to call it a hefty bag, hefty bag kind of plastic. The, oh, I know. Um, the kind of plastic bag that you would use in your kitchen size uh, trash can would be perfect for that. I'm going to put that on next. And then you're going to take your masking tape uh, and apply, you know, you're going to write your name on your masking tape. In your kit, you have a Sharpie and masking tape. You're going to take your Sharpie and you're going to put your name on it. You'll write your name on a, on a piece of tape. It could be your last name. Initials don't work because there might be more than one CT in the class. Now, the next place, next thing that's going to happen is you're going to put it in the works in progress side of the room. Now, if your project is too heavy to lift, then you're going to have to get a classmate to help you. You know what? I just occurred to me, Mr. Thiel, how big is too big? Well, if your project's so big you can't pick it up, it's too big. <laughs> okay. Um, in our next segment, I'll show how to uh, remove your project from the armature and hollow it out. And then we're going to put it back together so that when it fires, it, um, it'll survive the, the, the trial by fire.